I will keep moving right along. Uh, our, uh, our next speaker uh, was the organizer of this event and also the winner of 2017 Science Book of the Year in Finland, uh, Age of Energy. Uh, welcome, Rally Parkman. Thank you. I have to keep on organizing this seminar so I get to speak. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, I organized this uh, seminar in, in, I basically had two reasons. Um, one was the urgency of this topic and, and the, the amount of discussion that we've been having around it in Finland and to keep that going and, and improve the, on, on the discussion. And, and uh, another one uh, was that I also wrote a report, a study on the subject. It actually also came out yesterday. So is that a coincidence? <laughs> it is. <laughs> actually, yeah. Um, yeah, Willis, uh, Willis uh, peer reviewed study took its time to get, get through the peer review and my mine took time to get through the layout and printing and, and, and shipping. So um, I'm going to talk about the findings in this study on, on, on this occasion. And there's plentiful copies on the, on the back table. <laughs> I guess you had one on your seat, but you can take as many uh, as you want. Uh, I have multiple boxes waiting for me at home. So what's Think Atom? It's a non-profit think tank that we co-founded uh, last year. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, we kind of we tried to study and popularize, uh, popularize how we could use small nuclear reactors, advanced nuclear re reactors, to decarbonize uh, the energy sector, especially in the heating market where the needs and the abilities of SMRs kind of meet nicely. So not that much about electricity. Of course, it's a part of the heating market because you do electricity with steam, but, but that's another thing. And uh, like I said, today we published our first study funded by Umberista Pauli, for which I'm very, very thankful. It's a Finnish energy industry, it's kind of pool, research pool of, of funding for these kinds of things. So why heat? Uh, well, half of global energy end use is, is used as, he as heat. Only 20% is electricity. And then you have liquid fuels and, and other stuff. So it's a big thing which is not talked about enough. Uh, and it's mostly done with combustion. We seem to have some overlapping with the fonts. It's not my own computer, so that's, that might be the reason. I hope you bear with me. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is the heat energy demand in Europe by, by end use. It's about 6,000 terawatt hours, and half of that is, is space, space heating, which is in Europe mostly done with natural gas locally in the apartment or, or house. Uh, although in, in some countries like Nordics and Eastern Europe, we, are, uh, we have quite a bit of districating as well. Then we have hot water and other heat, which is about 1,000 terawatt hours, and uh, some industrial processes that <coughs> Ville actually talked about, which often require uh, quite a bit um, higher temperatures than, than districating. So here's the study structure. Uh, we first look at the Finnish district heating networks what kind of uh, systems there are, what are the sizes um, and, and their demand. Then we look at, at the availability upcoming uh, small reactors. And then we do some modeling combining these two, kind of trying to find good sized reactors for, for the right size of, of different heating system and kind of trying to find the maximum <laughs> amount of energy you could decarbonize while still operating at, at a high load factor for, for the reactor to keep it economic. Then we look at the emissions reduction potential. After we find out how much energy we can produce, we can also think uh, how much fuels we could displace, displaced by those reactors. And uh, then we look at some business cases and models because uh, it will be challenging to have 
dozens of small nuclear operators because it has a big a lot of uh, baggage when you when you become a nuclear operator so there should be some innovative ideas around how to organize the business the business model so we discussed some of those <coughs> those in the study as well and uh, in the end we kind of discuss some of the licensing regulation and public discussion themes what should be happening what we need to do and 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 stuff like that. So, yeah, let's go to the first topic, which was the, the heating systems in, in Finland. So the total demand is a little bit over 35 terawatt hours a year, and they're distributed like this. So in the, below you have the sizes, so this is smaller than 150 gigawatt hours per day. There's over 100 of these. And uh, basically 40 of the largest ones, which are those on the circle, use about 80% of the total district heating energy in Finland. And when you go condense a bit, 10 of the largest use 60% of the energy, 4 of the largest use 40%, and Helsinki, I'm so sorry about the slides though, Helsinki uses about 20% of the total Finnish uh, district heating. But these were basically the the ones that we looked at in the study. Because this tiny ones, I mean, you could have a micro reactor there, but it, I, I think that it doesn't make any sense because you can do that in, in other ways as well, like biofuels and stuff like that that you have locally, locally available. And this is uh, the, the fuels and energy sources that we used uh, for district heating in, in, in Finland. So as you can see, about half is still done with fossil fuels and peat. <coughs> and then the other half is done by mostly biofuels, uh, industry waste, and, and some waste heat streams. OK. The next part was looking into the small nuclear reactors. We had some of those in the previous uh, presentation as well. So uh, we had these heat-only reactors. They're kind of interesting. Uh, as Villa as said, they could be cheaper, cheaper to produce because they don't have high temperatures or high pressures. So we had uh, three reactors from China, one 400 megawatt and two 200 megawatts. Then we also looked at the SECURE, that was the Swedish-Finnish cooperation from the 70s. And then we have this hypothetical fin reactor, kind of micro reactor that you, you could use for the smaller, uh, not the smallest, but the smaller uh, networks in Finland. And it, it could also be potentially designed and manufactured mostly in Finland. And uh, we will have a session about that later on. Then we also had, of course, uh, it's kind of normal SMRs, light water reactors like uh, New Scale. We'll be presenting later. Smart from South Korea will be presenting later as well. Uh, then we have the Russian KLT 40S and Rhythm 200, the barge reactors that also have kind of feasibility or, or uh, some conceptual designs planned for kind of onshore use as well. Uh, and then we have the BW Airx 300 from uh, G Hitachi, which we'll also be presenting later. Uh, that's actually the biggest one in this. And then we also looked at some of the kind of advanced non-water non reactors, such as the HTRPM, which is a bevel bed high temperature reactor. They are finishing up in, in China and starting up this year, uh, I hope. <laughs> That was the case last year as well, so <laughs> that's why that's why there is the I hope always until it, it commences. And then we had the integral molten salt reactor IMSR from from Canada, which will be presented later today. And uh, also a mention of the Swedish sealer lead cooled fast reactor, very exciting, and uh, the prism from G Hidachi as well. These are a little bit often high temperature reactors, so they are not. They are suitable for district heating, but it's a bit overkill. So you would like to do something else with the high quality heat first and maybe then get a waste stream from that and, and use that for district heating. So 
there's potential for this kind of cogeneration or even tree generation with these reactors. Then we get into the modeling part where we try to find the right reactors for the right size of, of networks. Uh, we chose these sizes for the uh, kind of ballpark that we have, 200, 500, 1500, 2400 and, and 7000 gigawatt hours per year demand. Uh, and then we had Poland with 2500 and, and 1400. And this is actually small change for the printed edition. There had been a little bit of an error in my, in my data source. They had put megawatt hours instead of gigajoules. And I didn't catch that until like last week when it was too late to do anything about it. But I have updated the slides and the PDF that will be coming, coming online will have the updated information as well. It's not a huge difference. It's just basically the amount of reactors that you could fit in Poland decreases, uh, especially in, in, in Warsaw, because that is a single city, city there that's much bigger than the other ones. So that shrinks to about a half of, the, of, of what is in, in the booklet. And these were the reactor sizes we chose for, for inspecting. So there's the fin reactor, the micro reactor. Uh, then there's 200 megawatt, 400 megawatt, and 900 megawatt. And these are thermal, thermal capacities. And then for combined heat and power, we looked at 200 and 900 megawatt reactors. And most of the cases were looking at doing a heat only production because modeling combined heat and power with these kind of prices and stuff like that is beyond my Excel skills. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm glad to have uh, Ville Tulki and other colleagues who do that, that work uh, much better than me. So I try to keep them kind of simple and try to find the scales of things that, that we need. So there are some exp examples of combined heat and power and, and, when, as, and uh, district co cooling potential is also mentioned because it's at, at least for me, it, it was kind of counterintuitive, but you can use 90 degree hot water to do district cooling, which is kind of weird, but it's a potential kind of uh, use for the summertime when there is much less demand for, for hot water and, and heat, then you can, but more demand for, for cooling. So uh, I'm gonna show loads of these, these kind of slides. This is what my Excel gives me when I, put the uh, numbers in. So this is a, a small network of 200 gigawatt hours. And we have about 20 of these in Finland that are between 150 and, and 350. And we have a single small reactor doing their work there. It works at 75% load factor, which is not optimal, but decent if you have a cheap capital cost with the reactor. And it manages to produce almost 80% of the energy demand in the network, so it is significant. Here is two of those reactors in a 500 gigawatt hour network. We have about a dozen of those in, in Finland, working at 80, 83% and, and producing 70% of the energy demand. As you can see, there's the winter demand which is much, much higher, uh, over five <coughs> times higher than the summer, summer low. So, so that's why it's, uh, I'm trying to kind of find the optimal things where you have a decent amount of energy produced and a high, high load factor. So we have, then we have uh, about five district heating systems that are around 1500 gigawatt hours, so 1.5 terawatt hour. And that, uh, I put five of these small reactors in the, in the that because then you can uh, do the maintenance in the summertime when there is lower demand and that brings up the economics. On the other hand, you will have a lot of more reactors to take care of, so probably gonna need more, more people working there, which is jobs. I hear it's a good thing, <laughs> of course. So uh, they're actually running at, at pretty much optimal load factor of 88% and producing almost two thirds of the energy in the, in the network. And uh, you could also 
barely uh, put one reactor, well, like a one 200 megawatt reactor in, in this same size uh, network. The, the load factor goes down a bit, but it does manage to produce quite a bit of the, the energy. Moving on, uh, one 200 megawatt reactor in, uh, well, we have three of these 2.4 terawatt hour demand networks, and they are Turku, Tampere, and Espo, if I remember right. So you could have one reactor that's producing 61% uh, of, the, of the energy and, and running at a decent 83% load factor. Uh, here's one of the tries I had with the combined heat and power. So you have three 200 megawatt reactors running in an CHP, uh, producing also el electricity. They produce about a one terawatt hour of electricity, as well as 99% as of the heat demand of these kinds of. So you could, just to find out how you could actually do the whole thing with nuclear if you wanted. I'm not saying that we should do it because we have other uh, good energy sources as well, such as heat pumps and, and, and other renewable energy sources. Um, but this was just finding out how much you need to do it only with nuclear. Uh, then we go to the Helsinki size. We have one system that is seven terawatt hours. Here, uh, tried to put three, three 200 megawatt reactors in, in Helsinki doing heat only. So you produce two thirds of the energy at, at, at reasonably high load factor. And then if you do combine heat and power and want to do a bit more, then you can have eight 200 megawatt reactors, which produce pretty much all the heat and also about two terawatt hours of power each year. Then we go to Poland. So here's, uh, they have about s uh, around half a dozen systems between two and three terawatt hours of, of demand. And you, so you could have one, one uh, 200 megawatt reactor there. The, the good thing about, well, good, good thing about Poland is that you will be replacing coal if you do this, because it's basically almost uh, all, the, all the district heating in, in Poland is either coal or heavy oil maybe some biomass somewhere. Uh, so you could fit one of these reasonably well, 75% load factor. Uh, they have a weird uh, distribution of energy demand, as you can see, the February is a kind of outlier. I don't know why that is. Maybe they have this kind of Siberian uh, climate a bit, so that they have a really cold February, but still don't have enough insulation, like we do in Finland, I don't know. Uh, it depends al also on the city, of course, uh, a little bit, so. Mm, then there's Poland for, for combined heat and power. You could have four, four of the 200 megawatt reactors in these smaller towns and produce pretty much all of the heat and, and quite a bit of electricity as well. And then you have Warsaw, uh, where you could put, for example, three of the G Hitachi uh, 900 megawatt reactors producing combined heat and power to produce 80% 80, 80 of the heat and, and some three terawatt hours of power as well. These are not uh, like very accurate numbers, as you can see, there's no decimal <laughs> things. It's just uh, the ballpark uh, of the numbers. So some conclusions for the modeling. I find out that this kind of 65-85 rule, so uh, if you have heat-only reactors, you can do 65% of the demand while the reactor is running at 85% load factor, depending a little bit on the reactor size and, and how f well it fits into the profile. But that's kind of the rule of thumb I found in, in Finland. And uh, if you have combined heat and power, that brings more flexibility because you can do more more power in the summer and, and more heat in the winter but also of course increases the capital investment because you have more you need to have the turbines and and press service cells and, and stuff like that good and you can also use district cooling to kind of increase the load factor 
if you have a district cooling uh, system installed, you can use the summertime extra heat to, to offer district cooling. And the emissions reductions potential, uh, we kind of inspected three different values for emissions that would be replaced. So there's the current average of 130 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour of heat. Uh, then I had this mix of natural gas, coal and peat that could be replaced at the margin. If you have a reactor, it would likely replace coal because that's becoming illegal and maybe natural gas because that's expensive and so forth. So that's about 250 grams. And then uh, also use this kind of mix of forest industry residue side products as in cubic meters of how many uh, cubic meters you could save those residues for some other use, for example, at a rate of about one megawatt hour of energy contained in, in one cubic meter. And for Poland, we assumed that it was coal, so that's 350 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. These are for heat, that's why they are lower than, for electricity, that's, that's three times higher. And then we had uh, emission trading system prices set at 20 bucks, which is about the current price, I think, and then 50 bucks, which should be the price in about 10 years, maybe 15, depending how well we let the ETS operate. So, uh, the, here are the cost per megawatt hour of, from, from the emissions trading system. So uh, if we are replacing the average emissions in, in, in the networks, so it, it's, at current prices it's 2.8 euros per megawatt hour that we are saving from, from ETS, and uh, at the future price of 50 euros per ton, it's, it's seven. But if you are replacing this kind of heavier mix of gas and coal and peat at 250 grams, the prices, uh, the cost come to five and twelve point five euros uh, per megawatt hour of saved saved money. And in Poland, you you get even more. Am I running out of time? Yes, I am. So uh, this is the kind of table collection of the how much you could do with the small networks that had the kind of micro reactors. So you could save uh, maybe about a million tons of CO two if you replaced 60% of the energy with nuclear reactors. And those are the prices. Prices here at 50 euros per ton, you would be saving between 40 to 75 million euros per, per year on the ETS market. And this is the situation for the actually the three other systems. So we have five 1.5 terawatt systems, which are together seven. Terawatt hours, then we have three 2.4 terawatt hour systems, which also add up to seven, and then we have Helsinki, which is also seven. Those is one, one table can explain all of, <laughs> all of those, those um, cases. And uh, here is the kind of combined of those three systems that have a total, total demand of 21, 21 terawatt hours. And we assume that nuclear would produce about 15 so about 60% of that total. So you could save almost 200 million on, on the emissions trading system. Of course, you can save those with other technologies as well, but this is just a, to, to bring the kind of economic case to light. And of course, most of the emissions and fossil fuels could be replaced because like I said in the beginning, about half the energy produced with fossil fuels, and if you do 60% of the energy with nuclear, then you are replacing all the fossil fuels in the mix. And here's a potential roadmap. Uh, I'm gonna hurry up a little bit. I hope we also hurry up with this, because it's like the business, of, business as usual, and we need to get it done a couple of years faster if we want to uh, get to the coal ban, which will happen in 2029. So maybe get the legislation a bit faster and uh, have the site and construction li license a bit faster and then you're good. <laughs> we have uh, so the chapter on politics. We're going to need to have substantial changes in the legislation and regulation to make them more feasible. They're not impossible to do now but basically they're infeasible because it's very hard to 
site reactors near populations and, and stuff like that. It's expensive for the licensing procedure and, and I think we're going to discuss these uh, topics more. Um, yeah, and we need also to think about new ways to use nuclear, not just for electricity production, but for heat produ produ production uh, and industrial heat production. So we have the chicken and egg problem, really, is that if we want to prepare them, these changes, we would need to have a project so we can either identify what that product, pro project needs. But before we could have a project, we need to have a regulation and legislation in place because nobody will be like put millions on a project that they don't know anything uh, what the regulation will look like on the other end. So this needs to be handled somehow. We can ask the politicians in the afternoon how they can make that happen. So some conclusions. We have many suitable reactors coming already in the 2020s. So the bottleneck is, is not really the technology. It's, the, it's on our end. It's a regulation, legislation, public acceptance discussion here in Finland and elsewhere in the world. We are actually kind of forerunners in this. So the rest of the world looks even worse regarding this. Uh, there's room for about two gigawatts of thermal capacities. Uh, I used in the in the roadmap there was six or seven 200 megawatt reactors and 25 of the small 24 megawatt reactors in the in the roadmap that I just showed you and that adds up to two gigawatts of total capacity. And uh, the 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 kind of levelized cost of nuclear heat is somewhere between 15 and 30 euros per megawatt hour. <laughs> of course, we know how to do nuclear as expensive as we want. But this kind of assumes that we are reasonable about it and, and get some kind of sensible regulation and, and legislation in place. And e even if we are talking only heat, only about heat only as a Mars, we could replace most of the fossil fuels that are used in, in district heating in Finland. With as a Mars capable of combined heat and power, we can do even more. Like I say here, but it doesn't show <laughs> because the font size is. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Well, good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, we will have a panel discussion as well, but you can. Okay. Yeah, question uh, re regarding the load following, because uh, you showed uh, quite correctly the monthly load differences. Yeah. But there are also within week days are a little bit different and uh, within days there are also uh, different people wake up, use the shower and then the demand is higher. It is not relative uh, in a sense that is, sense that is relative in, uh, for uh, electricity production. Yeah. We have uh, hourly pricing, so this is not the case in district heating, but you have uh, still uh, need for uh, additional power uh, for more uh, thermal in some days sure. and some hours and uh, so there is um, so could you please comment on that? Yeah, 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 sure. So, so I only got, got uh, district heating data on a monthly resolution which was fine with me because we only I, I don't want to have this kind of very scientific and, and uh, sharp answers for this but if you look at page 44 on the report there's some some stuff on, on load following uh, it's done with new scale uh, reactor. Uh, I stole the pictures from their their studies. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that is a topic, especially for the electricity. Uh, for the heating thing, it it's not that much of a topic because you always have some storage in the system, and you you have some heat storages. They're what like hundred times yes. cheaper than storing electricity. So so it. But yeah, this was the resolution that that I could manage. And I was not looking at electrici electricity specifically, so it was just kind of came along with the combined heat and power. The heat was the kind of main main focus, on, so that's that's why it's not it's not de dealt uh, with that that extensively in, in the study. 